When it comes to Seiko divers, over the last five years, I've really stayed in the shallow end of their pool. After all, that's their bread and butter, that's what they're known for. But this year, one of my plans was to set a foot in the deeper end of that pool, to finally try something in their mid to high tier price range, if for no other reason than as a reviewer to get first hand experience with what they can really do. The only problem was that I couldn't quite figure out what I wanted to get. Every time I'd look, I'd see some watches I was interested in, but I wasn't quite taken with them enough to really pay that kind of money for them, and especially after spending so much time with some fantastic micro brands. However, that all changed when Seiko announced a new set of Save the Ocean watches that were inspired by the glaciers of Antarctica. If you're a regular viewer, you know I like unusual dials. So one look at that press release, and I knew exactly what I wanted. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today we're going to look at the Seiko SPB-299, also known as the Glacier Marine Master Reduced, a watch that I think is practically the perfect Seiko diver, with maybe two exceptions, both of which we'll get to in time. One you might be expecting, but the other will probably surprise you. Now, according to Seiko, this is, and I quote, the Prospec 1968 Divers Modern Reinterpretation Save the Ocean Special Edition. Quite a mouthful to be sure, as well as quite a lot to unpack. So we might as well talk about what this watch is and where it really fits into Seiko's modern lineup, which I think will be especially useful for those that don't have Seiko's catalog memorized. I know I don't. So I'm going to try to be quick with all of this, but if you feel like you already know all about the Marine Master family, feel free to skip ahead. Now, to do this, we need to go all the way back to 1968 to that watch they were talking about, which is reference number 6215-7000. Now, this is not Seiko's first diver. That was the 62 Moss. But this was their first real professional level diver. And it's important in Seiko's history as it's the dive watch that really defined their design language for decades to come. Now, fast forward to the early 2000s, and Seiko comes out with sort of a refresh of that, with what's now become known as the Marine Master 300, a true beast of a watch that was 44mm wide and 15.4mm thick. This is a professional dive watch with a capital P. And for a lot of people, this is really the grail of Seiko divers, mostly because it has Grand Seiko level finishing, as well as a Grand Seiko level movement, as well as a Grand Seiko level price. Around 2016, Seiko came out with what is now known as the Baby Marine Master, or the Marine Master 200. Although despite that name, it's not any smaller. It's still a 44mm wide watch, it's just the Marine Master 200 is a tad thinner, downgraded to a 6R movement, as well as downgraded to about a third of the price. I know this is getting pretty confusing, but this is the part where it all ties together. About two years ago, Seiko came out with a smaller 42mm version of that Marine Master 200, which is where this watch fits into the Marine Master family. There are a couple different nicknames for these floating around, but the one I like is Marine Master Reduced or Marine Master 200 Reduced. There are also a couple of different colorways of it, but this one is the newest Save the Ocean Special Edition version. Save the Ocean watches are special editions by Seiko. They're basically the exact same watch, with the only real difference being a special dial and they do this to help raise awareness about the state of the ocean. And I'm actually wearing another Save the Ocean Seiko, and this is my Antarctica Monster, which again is just like a regular monster, but this one has a very special dial. I know that took some time, but where this watch fits into the Seiko family as well as the Marine Master family is important to point out, especially because it's one of the major reasons I wanted it, as unfortunately a lot of the higher tier Seiko divers are larger watches with the 62 Moss as well as the Marine Master Reduced being two of the major exceptions. I've always liked the Marine Master case design, and with this being a smaller version, it was a clear choice. Anyway, enough history, let's get to it, and let's start off with the specs. With this reduced Marine Master, you're looking at a 42mm wide case, as well as a lug to lug of 48.8 and a total thickness just over 13mm, which does include a flat sapphire with AR as well as Seiko's Prospect Wave style case back. It has a 20mm lug width as well as drilled lugs, making this a great, if not unusual, strap monster, as well as Seiko's 6R35 movement, a diver's rated 200 meters of water resistance with a screw down crown, and everything here has been treated with Seiko's proprietary Dia Shield anti scratch resistant coating. So, as far as Seiko watches go, this is just about everything you could want, including fantastic wearability. 
It may be a 42 by 48.8 platform, but thanks to the curvy sleek case shape, it wears much closer to a 40 millimeter. Even more so once you take the bracelet off. And this is important to note, because if you're between the reduced Marine Master and a 62 Moss, that because of the difference in case shapes, I think they're going to wear the same. The 62 Moss has a flatter design, where the Marine Master has this beautiful curvature to it, with lugs that extend down and spring bars placed at the very tip. Making it a watch you can easily and comfortably wear all day, regardless if you have it on a bracelet or a strap. The curvature of the case seems to perfectly line up with my 7 and a quarter inch wrist. The case is one of the Marine Master family's biggest strengths, across the board. Not only is it a great design, but the finish is fantastic. The Marine Master 300 will probably have a better finish, but trust me, the 200s will not disappoint. One thing that surprised me right out of the box was just how polished this case is. The top has a nice brushed finish to it, as does a very narrow band on the midline of the case, but there's a pretty large polished beveled edge on both the top and bottom of the case extending out even to the farthest tip of the lugs, and this winds up creating a polished brushed Oreo with that midline. The case already has a very beautiful streamlined design, yet that polished edge highlights as well as softens the edge, giving it an even more sleek appearance. Normally I'd be a little concerned with this much polish on the side of what is essentially a tool watch, as they do tend to collect micro scratches, yet here Seiko's Shield coating should help protect that. And so far, I think it's done a great job. Although, as you see in some of these shots, that polished area, and especially the tip of the lugs, is still very much a fingerprint magnet. And as far as I know, there's no coating that's going to help with that. For some, I think they're going to look at this and think there's way too much polish on what is a tool watch. At which point, if you're in that camp, I'd say check out the 62 Moss, as it does have more of a utilitarian look. But overall, I'd say the Marine Master strikes a good balance creating a tool watch with a touch of refinement, perhaps in the same way a Submariner does it, but here I think it's a much more interesting case design. Although what's not interesting is the crown, or at least the crown's design. It's screwed down, tucked up in that typical Seiko 345-ish position, so it's very easy to use, yet at the same time, I'm a little annoyed that even at this price, it's still blank and generic looking. Seiko still doesn't give you a signed crown. And in some ways, this is in contrast to the case back. Flipping the watch over, you'll see that it's a standard case back that's on every Prospect Diver. It's a good looking case back that includes their standard wave medallion. So it's nothing special, but compared to the crown, at least it's an interesting design. Back to the front, let's talk about the bezel. The bezel here has a coin edge, it's 120 click, unidirectional, and has the same action just about every other Seiko Diver has. So if you've ever had one, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not bad, but it's also not exceptionally good either. It's nicely defined, yet the audible and tactical click are a bit muted compared to other brands. And the $6 million question that I'm sure some of you are asking is, is the bezel aligned? And the answer is no, but it is really close. If I zoom in, it might be off by a half a degree, maybe a little more than that. But it's close enough that at a glance, it looks like it is lined up. So for the most part, I'd say it's good enough. Although at this price, is good enough really good enough? Probably not. But at this point, everyone kind of knows about this, and honestly, I'm also a little tired of talking about it. Plus, we still have a lot more interesting things to talk about. Like the bezel insert. In some of these shots, the insert may look black, but it's really more of a dark blue or maybe dark teal, which in the right lighting looks absolutely fantastic with the dial, and especially with its glossy finish, which is in contrast to the textured dial. It highlights and just frames that beautiful glacier texture. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I think the bezel insert here is aluminum. They don't explicitly say it anywhere, and I did try getting a hold of Seiko to find out, but they never got back to me. Typically in this price range, aluminum is what you get with Seiko. The only thing that gives me pause is that this isn't your typical brushed aluminum insert from Seiko, as it has a rather glossy sheen. Honestly, it'd be really nice if it was ceramic, but I think that's just wishful thinking. This is Seiko we're talking about. So more likely it's aluminum with a slightly different finish, or maybe it's the Dia Shield coating that's giving it that sheen. Although if I actually ever hear back from Seiko, I will pin a comment down below with what they say. 
Now, I have one last thing to point out before we get to the dial. Zooming in, you'll notice that the flat crystal has an angled edge to it, and this creates a gap between it and the bezel insert. Initially, I was a bit put off by this, as I kept thinking it was just going to be a trap for lint and dirt. Yet, after a few days of wearing the watch, I realized that this isn't just a stylistic choice, but rather a really ingenious design element, as that angled edge is positioned just beyond the edge of the chapter ring on the dial. So when you look down at the watch, you still clearly see that chapter ring, and yet that crystal's edge gives you the illusion of a second chapter ring magnified sitting just beyond the original. Which not only looks cool, as it extends out the chapter ring and dial, but it also makes the watch easier to read and easier to set the timing bezel with, as your eyes are automatically drawn to that magnified image, which sits directly next to the bezel, rather than, say, the smaller chapter ring underneath. It's a minor thing in the grand scheme of the design, but I think it's a brilliant idea. Anyway, let's move on to the glacier dial. Now, beauty is always in the eye of the beholder, and I think some are going to look at this and prefer a more classic version, with a standard blue or black dial. But personally, I think this is magnificent. The intensity of the blue can change depending on the angle and lighting, but for the most part, I'd say this image here is very true, and it'd best be described as this metallic electrified light blue, or maybe aqua, which is then paired with this thick vertical texturing, done to mimic the side of a glacier. The way the light ripples across those textures as you move your wrist around is amazing. It's truly beautiful and unique, and even after a month, I'm still in awe when I look at it. The dial is then paired with your typical Marine Master design, which is a series of dots and dashes, as well as a larger index of the 12. Now, since this is a smaller or reduced Marine Master, those indices are also reduced, and especially the dots which in some ways is reminiscent to me of the older subs, before they went to the maxi dials. Regardless, the indices have a silver metallic frame that is then filled with white luminous paint, matching the silver and white Marine Master handset, with the one exception of the light blue dot on the second hand. And I can't explain it, but that blue dot is something I really love, and wound up being one of the reasons I picked this over, say, the 62 Moss version. It doesn't offer a ton of contrast, but with the white dot next to it, it doesn't really need to. Yet there's just something about it sitting over that glacier dial I really love, possibly just because it's really different. Another thing I really like is the finish on the handset. If you zoom in, you'll notice a raised midline going down the hands, where there's a slight angle going down either side of it. But what really surprised me here is that each side of the hands has a different finish, with one side having a polished finish and the other having a brushed. And this is something I've seen Seiko do before on their dress watches with Daphine hands, specifically with their two cocktail time watches, but I've never seen them do this on a diver. Normal Daphine hands are completely polished, and they just tend to get lost in darker environments. In fact, they're the bane of my existence when I need to photograph one. But here, since the two different finishes reflect light in different ways, it creates a handset that you can make out in more situations as well as creates a midline that your eyes are automatically drawn to, as that's where the transition point between the two different reflections are. With their dress watches, I think it's a brilliant idea. And in a lot of ways, I think the same principle applies here as well. Not to mention, I think it also adds just a touch of refinement, which the date window at the three could probably also use. It's not bad, it's just your typical cutout, but at this price, something more would be nice. Although at least they didn't add a cyclops, which then leads us to talk about the standard amount of text on the dial. One thing I noticed when I compared this to, say, my monster, is that the font on the Marine Master is a little bit smaller, which I think when you combine the black ink against that blue dial really helps it fade into the background, at least compared to some of the other Seikos out there. Overall, though, it's a beautiful dial and design, one that creates a fantastic balance between form and function. The unusual glacier dial creates a stunning sight to behold, Yet, not so much that it ever distracts from the handset or indices. With them, there's always enough contrast that they come through clearly. Just like the case, there's a balance here that creates a bold tool watch with just a touch of refinement. As for the loom, believe it or not, this is one of the two big negatives for this watch. I honestly had some high hopes for this one, as multiple people told me that Seiko loom in this price range is superior to their affordable counterparts. But after testing this one, I think this watch would suggest otherwise. 
When the lights go out, it initially looks good. It's nice and bright, and looks like almost every other Seiko out there. Unfortunately though, Seiko didn't give this one quite enough loom to go the distance. In my longevity test, I had it up against my turtle, monster, and again, since I had some high hopes, I put one of the three kings of loom in here, the Orient Star Diver. And as you can see, it is easily the weakest out of the bunch, especially the dial. The hands seem to hold on just a little bit longer and fade out before those other divers. And considering that this watch costs three times what those other divers do, this is both annoying as well as disappointing. But wait, it actually gets a little bit worse because I decided to compare this to a $200 Seiko 5 Dress KX, the smaller sports watch version of the 5KX. It's close, but I'd still say the Dress KX is the winner. Now, realistically, the loom here is still okay to good. It's still okay enough to go diving and should still last you mostly through the night. In some ways, it also makes some sense. Since this is a smaller dial and the indices are smaller dots, there's not as much surface area here compared to those other Seigos. So if they're using the same loom and the same layers of loom, it makes sense that it would be dimmer. But if that is the case, then Seiko, you need to use more or better loom just to compensate for that. Because this is one of your premier divers and it shouldn't be bested in any capacity by your entry level divers let alone a $200 budget entry-level sports watch. Put it bluntly, there's no excuse for it. So disappointing and annoying. But if there's one takeaway from this, it should be that just because Seiko is known for great loom doesn't mean you're always going to get great loom, regardless of the price point. Honestly, I could go on about this for a while, but for now, let's just move on to the movement. And for this, Seiko has wisely chosen to use their 6R35 movement. I'm sure some of you out there would prefer a higher beat movement. But this is still an upgrade over their standard 4R series, and this one does come with a reported 70 hours of power. So as far as Seiko movements go, it's still a good choice. As for the bracelets, it's a little rattly, but surprisingly good, and especially after being disappointed by Seiko bracelets for years. This is one you'll actually want to keep on the watch. It's an oyster style bracelet with curvy sides, as well as a boxy mid-link. It's mostly brushed, but it has polished sides as well as polished tops and bottoms of that boxy mid-link. Which when combined with a nice taper going from 20 to 16 looks great with the sleek and streamlined nature of the case. It has solid end links, solid links, and check this out. An actual Seiko milled clasp. It does exist. It also includes that goofy Seiko divers extension clasp, even though no one ever actually uses it. The links are also secured with collar and pins, which can be a pain to size, but in the long run, I think they are more secure than screws. The only real negative I'd say with this one is the clasp, that it's a bit long and maybe a little chunky, at least compared to the sleek and streamlined case. But even with that, I think you'd have a hard time finding a better option, especially because it's also treated with that same die shield coating. Although, if you want to try something new, drilled lugs make this one easy to change out. And as you can see, it makes a very unique strap monster. And lastly, let's talk about the other big negative, value. Seiko's MSRP is 1250 on these. But if you look around on the gray market, you'll find them closer to a grand. Which, make no mistake about it, that's a good chunk of change for a watch, and especially a Seiko. Now, in terms of value, there's a couple of ways to look at this one. And the first of which is that if you're solely focused on main brand watches, and especially Seiko. And if that's the case, I could see a very solid value argument here. And especially if you're someone who's been obsessed with the Marine Master 300, this is a great alternative. It may not have the Grand Seiko movement, but it's a third the price, and in my opinion, has vastly superior wearability, all thanks to that smaller case. However, this argument completely falls apart once you start to broaden your horizons, as there are a ton of alternatives out there that give you a far more bang for your buck. I'm sure you're all thinking of some right now, but I'm just going to quickly focus on two. The first is the Zealous Spearfish. It's currently sold out, but this one was up for an MSRP of $749, and at that price, you get everything you could want including great loom, an interesting and unusual dial, as well as a high beat movement with 60 hours of power reserve. The only thing that I'd say the Marine Master 200 has over the Zelos is a better finishing on the case. 
But that's where the second example comes in, with the Orient Star Diver. Now, this is a different size and a different style, but I think this is still one of the best divers currently out there. And at the moment, it's still a bit of a sleeper, so you can get a deal on it. Now, it's not perfect, but what you get here is pretty close to that Seiko at twice the price. And that also includes an extended 50 hour power reserve, as you can see from the meter on the dial. So there's not much value here. And to be honest, that's quite typical of Seiko these days. That doesn't mean you shouldn't buy them. After all, the heart wants what the heart wants. It just means that you should know you're gonna pay a premium for them. And in some ways, I think that's why I'm more attracted to the Save the Ocean versions. I mean, I figure if I'm gonna pay a premium, I might as well get something unique, something that no other brand is gonna offer. And when it comes to unique and interesting dials, no one does it like Seiko. They are a master at it, at least when they want to be. The regular Marine Masters are fantastic in their own right, and as long as you're willing to pay a premium, I think it's hard to go wrong with any of them. For me though, this is just about the perfect Seiko Diver, with Loom being the only true weak link. Yet I think the sleek case, fantastic finish, and the excellent wearability, as well as that gorgeous unique dial, are more than enough to balance that out. And I have to say between this and my Antarctica monster, I think I'm done with Seiko divers, at least for myself. I still get some here and there for the channel. But personally, any desire I had to get a Tuna or a 62 Moss is completely gone. I have to say I'm happy and content with these two, which in this hobby is something that's really hard to put a price on. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. As usual, let me know what you think about the Seiko Glacier Marine Master Reduced, or your thoughts on any of the premium Seikos out there. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and I'll see you next time.